بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of Women Around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Among our mothers, among the wives of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, whom we all acknowledge are the best of women. There was a wife and her name was Zainab bint Khuzayma. And her father's name was Khuzayma ibn al-Harith. Her mother was a famous woman by the name of Hind bint Auf bin Zuhair. Hind had many daughters and she got her daughters married to some of the dignitaries of Quraysh. So just to be married to one of her daughters meant that you will be connected to so many in-laws and people who are related to you through her. So she was the mother of Zainab bint Khuzayma. May Allah be pleased with her, the mother of the believers. And she also was the mother of Maymuna bint al-Harith, who later on became the wife of the Prophet also. She was the mother of Umm al-Fadl, the wife of al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet And she was also the mother of Salma bint Umais, the wife of the uncle of the Prophet Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. She's also the mother of Asma bint Umais, who was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the cousin of the Prophet When he was martyred, she married Abu Bakr, as-Siddiq, the first caliph. And when he died, she married Ali ibn Abi Talib, the brother of her first husband and the cousin of the Prophet So her in-laws, her family, those whom were connected to her and to her siblings were honorable people. And no wonder, because someone that the dignitaries of Quraysh seek after getting marriage from their daughters must be of a certain caliber. Zainab bint Khuzayma was known before Islam to be caring, loving, and merciful to the poor and to the needy. And that is why she was known as the mother of the needy, Ummul Masakin. When she died, she was only 30 years of age. And before the Prophet ﷺ married her, she was married to Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn al-Muttalib. And Ubaidah is one of the first to accept Islam. And he was among the three heroes of Islam who came to a duel in the beginning of the Battle of Badr. The first major battle between truth and falsehood between Islam and disbelief. 300 plus men only going out to attack a convoy coming from Syria to Mecca, looking for the money, for the wealth, in compensation for what was taken from them, only to find that they've missed that caravan and instead an army of a thousand men or more 
with knights, camels, with full artillery and weapons, fully armed, is there to fight them. They only took something that was to be used with a caravan, unarmed. So they didn't have any heavy weaponry. So in the beginning, the disbelievers, the idol worshippers, Utbah and Shayba, the sons of Rabi'ah, and al Walid ibn Utbah, came out asking for a duel. So three from the people of Medina, from the Ansar, came out and identified themselves. But the idol worshipper said, you are honorable people, but we want our next of kin. We want our own people, the Muhajireen, the migrants, to fight them. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered Ubaid ibn al-Harith, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, all from his closest kin. And they fought. And they managed to win. Hamza killed the one he was fighting. Ali killed the one who was fighting. Ubaidah ibn al-Harith and if I'm not mistaken, it was Utbah who was fighting him. They exchanged blows and they were injured. So then they finished him off. Ubaidah was injured in this battle and soon afterwards he died. Now being the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, and his wife being alone in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ proposed to her and after marrying Hafsa, the Prophet proposed to Zainab bint Khuzayma in the third year of Hijrah. And the Prophet ﷺ married her only to live with her for only three months. In some narrations say eight months. She soon afterwards passed away and died. So she was the second wife of the Prophet ﷺ to die in his lifetime. There were only two who died in his lifetime. Khadija, the mother of the believers, may Allah be pleased with her, and Zainab bint Khuzayma, may Allah be pleased with her. But in these three months, she gained the honor of this life and in the hereafter for being our Prophet's wife in paradise, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The second wife we are to talk about today, inshallah, is a well-known name. So whenever you hear her name, you don't have to look for the daughter of so-and-so and so. So whenever you hear the name of Khadija, this is an icon, you know it. When you hear the name Aisha, this is an icon by itself, you know it. When you hear the name Umm Salama, this is an icon of its own. Her real name is Hind bintu Abi Umayyah ibn al mughira And he was among the generous men of Quraysh. And this is an attribute to be praised when you're known to be generous and to give, this is something to be proud of in Arabia. Her mother was Atika bint Amr ibn Rabi'ah. And she was nicknamed by Salama because she married her cousin Abu Salama. And Abu Salama, may Allah be pleased with him, is the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. His mother is Barra bint Abdul Muttalib. So he was one of the Prophet's cousins ﷺ. And 
His name was Abdullah ibn Abdul Asad. He was among the first to accept Islam alongside with Umm Salama. And they suffered greatly in the beginning of the introduction of Islam to Quraysh. So they had to migrate to Abyssinia. Then they traveled back to Mecca. And then Abu Salama traveled and migrated to Medina. He had seen so many things in his life. When he wanted to migrate, and he was among the first, and some say he was the first to migrate to Medina, his in-laws came to the outskirts of Mecca. And they said to him, if you want to go, this is your problem. And if you want to take your wife with you, then this is your problem. So when she was prevented from going and accompanying her husband, her in-laws, the family of Abu Salama, took her son from her hands and said, we will not leave our son with her if you are migrating to Medina. And she stayed for a whole year weeping and crying, unable to go and catch up with her husband and unable to leave her son behind who was sort of abducted by his kin until they felt sorry for her and returned her son to her. So now they have been reunited. But the problem is that there's no one to take her to Medina. And to travel there, it may take like three to five good days on camel's back. So she went to the outskirts of Mecca every single day, trying to go and to leave until she decided to leave on her own, which was totally unheard of. Extremely dangerous for a woman to travel in the wilderness without any man protecting her. And Allah Azza wa Jal sent to her Uthman ibn Talha ibn Abi Talha who saw her, identified her and asked her where about is she going? And when she told him, he felt obligated to accompany her and to protect her. So he accompanied her to Medina and she praised his moral ethics and conduct that he had never looked at her and whenever she dismounted from her camel he would move few steps and give his back so that he would not see anything that was inappropriate he never spoke to her until he got her to Medina and left her and went back to Mecca this was the chivalry of the Arabs long back even those who were not Muslims this was instilled in them, being ma the feelings of, of being a man and being generous, being courageous, being courteous and respecting others. When Abu Salama was with the Prophet ﷺ, he was a very close companion to him. He is his cousin. Not only that, he is his brother through suckling because we know that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was born, he was given to Thuwaybiyah, which was the slave concubine of his uncle Abu Lahab. So she suckled him and she suckled Abu Salama and she also suckled Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. So all three are siblings through suckling. So Abu Salam was close to the Prophet ﷺ, and he fought Badr with him. And he also fought alongside the Prophet ﷺ in the battle of Uhud, which was on the third year of Hijrah, only to be wounded. And this wound did not recover completely. And few months later on, it erupted again 
and caused him to die. Now, there are milestones in people's lives. And if we were to ask Mother Um Salama, what is your milestone? She would definitely, without any doubt, say that it was that incident which accompanied the death of her husband, Abu Salama. She tells us that Abu Salama once came and he told her that I heard the Prophet والسلام, say, and by the way, this was the habit of the Muslims, of the companions. Whenever they hear a piece of information that is beneficial for the Muslim, they would convey it to them. And the first that they would convey it to is their family, their wives, their children. So he came in, immediately started preaching. I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, whoever is afflicted by a calamity and recites, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, we are to, for, to Allah, we, are, we belong to Allah and we shall return to him. And then supplicate by saying, Allahumma jurni fi masibati. Oh Allah, reward me in my calamity. Wakhlufni khayram minha. And substitute me with something better than that. So I memorized this hadith. Till the date that Abu Salama, my husband, passed away. So when he died, I immediately said this dua. But then I contemplated afterwards. Who can be better than Abu Salama? Substitute me with something better than it. Who can be better than Abu Salama? And after my iddah was over, and we know that the iddah of a widow is four months and ten days, I heard the Prophet والسلام, seek permission to meet me. And he came in. So he asked me and asked for my hand in marriage. So I explained to him, O Prophet of Allah, no one can reject you. No one can turn you down. You are the dream of every woman on earth. But the problem is, I am a jealous woman. And I am an old woman compared to your wives. And I have children. So I may be considered to some as access luggage. So the Prophet ﷺ, acknowledging that she was alone and that her husband was a close companion of his, his cousin, and his brother said to her, as for your age, I'm older than you. So this is not a legitimate reason. As for your jealousy, I will ask Allah Azza wa Jal to take care of it. And as for your children, I will provide for them and they are under my sponsorship. So she agreed and the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam married her and only then she thought to herself now i know what can be better than abu salama the wisdom of the prophet marrying someone with four children or three with someone who's not that young with someone who's alone and her tribe are not is not with her is that to show the community that Allah Azza wa Jal does not leave people stranded and in need without any help. So many times we have calamities, catastrophes, crises surrounding us and overwhelming us. And we think that this is the end. Not believing in Allah, not trusting Allah, not fully relying upon him, we soon would find the way out. And these are frequent lessons from Allah. 
to us if we were to only comprehend and understand. The Prophet والسلام, proposed to Umm Salama, her guardian was her son, and few of the companions were there alongside to witness such a marriage contract. Now, she lived with the Prophet والسلام, unlike other wives because she did not feel jealous. So she did not cause any problems to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet had a habit of visiting all of his nine wives when it was Asr time or the likes. So he would start with Umm Salama because she was the oldest of his wives and then end up with Aisha being the youngest. And he would sit for maybe 10, 15 minutes, chit-chatting, checking on them. And he would do, do this every single day, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Umm Salama was a chaste woman, a kind woman. And the Prophet appreciated her, alayhi salam. He appreciated her wisdom and kindness. He trusted her and he took in her children as his own, living in his house. And Allah Azza wa Jal would put in the Prophet's heart, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, caring for her. So he would probably give her gifts to indicate to her that she has a special place in his heart. One of the situations that she's well known of was that in the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet ﷺ went to Mecca to perform Umrah on the fifth or the sixth year of Hijrah, and he was blocked by the idol worshippers, so they wrote a treaty stating that this year he cannot come in, he has to go out. But they're wearing a haram. So the Prophet went and addressed the people who are wearing a haram, waiting eagerly to go and perform their umrah. He said to them, we signed the treaty, we have to go back to Medina, and hence whoever is blocked from completing his ritual, you know the ruling, which is that you have to slaughter your hadi, your sacrifice, and shave your heads. So, shave your heads and sacrifice your hadi. This was a directive from the Prophet ﷺ. To his astonishment, no one complied. So he went into his tent, being angry, and mentioned to Umm Salama what had happened from his people. They're not obeying me. So Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, said to him, O Prophet of Allah, would you like them to obey you? Go out, do not speak to a soul until you slaughter your own sacrifice and call the barber to shave off your head. So the Prophet went out of his tent, did not speak to anyone, slaughtered his own sacrifice, and ask the barber to shave his head. The moment he did this, all the companions came back to their senses. And they hastened to slaughter their sacrifice and to shave their own heads as if they were about to kill one another because of wanting to do it in a so quick fashion and manner. This is why the Prophet ﷺ loved Umm Salama for being wise, for being intellectual, due to her age and due to her upbringing as well. Being with the Prophet ﷺ, she narrated, as the Dhahabi, Imam al Dhahabi says in, his mus in her Musnad, 380 hadiths. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ had many things 
with his wives that the companions did not know. So she told us that the Prophet used to kiss her and go to pray without performing wudu. And the same hadith was narrated by Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. And also that she used to perform ghusl with the Prophet ﷺ, taking from the same bucket. And so many other hadiths about nocturnal emission for women when she was there, about menses, about so many topics that were among the things that she had witnessed herself. And she kept on, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, teaching and sharing this knowledge that she gained in the house of the Prophet ﷺ with the Muslims. When she died, some say she died at the age of 84, and some say that she died at the age of 90, and she died as the mother of the believers and one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. هذا والله أعلم ونسبة العلم إليه أسلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين